What's got into you all of a sudden? I just got finished telling what a nice young pig you be. Ma, I was just trying to be a sheepdog. Huh, enough wolves in the world already, without a nice lad like you turning nasty. You haven't got it in you, young'un. A pig learns how to hurt sheep, and that it's okay to be different. Our moms, Carol Abramson and Rochelle Brief, are back to discuss pizza in Australia, wise words from Conan O'Brien, and the ultimate prize for a blueberry pie eating contest. That'll do as we find out if Babe stands the test of time. It's the test of time, James and Alan have their say. Do the movies you love still hold up today? James says gladiator with a glut. Alan says as a father, blah, blah. It's the test of time, James and Alan have their say. Love still hold up today. Tens of time, James and Allen have to say, Do you really love still hold up today? Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special Mother's Day episode of the Test of Time podcast. I'm James Brief, and joining me as always is my co host, Alan Noah. How are you, Al? I am doing very well, and it's not just the two of us. We're here with our moms. I am joined by my mom, Carol Abramson. Hello, everybody. Good to be back. And James, your mom, Rochelle Brief, is here too. Hello, everyone. This is an encore performance. (laughs) Yes, yes. We had so much fun last year with our Mother's Day episode. We had to do it again. Absolutely. And I want to start by talking about how we came to the movie Babe, I don't know that it's the most fascinating story ever, but I kind of think it's worth talking about because what happened last year when we were talking about doing this thing, this Mother's Day episode, the emails that were going back and forth, Mom and Rochelle, you guys were being very, very polite. We were going back and forth of like, oh, what movie should we do? And you guys were both kind of saying, whatever, you pick, sure, it doesn't matter. And you were both being very agreeable. So then to kind of just get the ball rolling, I put a bunch of movies on a list and said, here, do any of these sound good? Just to kind of get the ball rolling. And then we picked the big chill for last year. And listeners, if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to that. That's a great one. But also on that list, I picked Babe. And I picked Babe because I know that you, Mom, love pigs. I love pigs. Piggies. (laughs) In in your house, there are... (laughs) How many pigs would you say, just around the house? Not live pigs, but pictures of pigs, pig statues, pig-related paraphernalia. Yeah, at least a hundred. Uh, that that <laughs> sounds conservative to me, but sure. There are a lot of pigs. So that's why I put Babe on the list. But then, James, you and, uh, and Rochelle, you too, you seem to be really into the idea as well. But then, Rochelle, you said you hadn't seen the movie, right? I had not seen the movie, but I adore pigs as well. I don't have little statues around, but from um, cartoons like Porky and Petunia and Pepe (laughs) the pig, um, I am familiar with the adorable little pigs. (laughs) Okay. James, had you seen it before? I've seen Babe. Yeah, I definitely remember this film. I hadn't remembered most of this film, except I definitely remember the ending because I love the ending of this film. (laughs) Did you see it like when you were a kid or was it like a later in life kind of thing? I definitely didn't see it in the theater, but it was one of those that uh, it got all this acclaim and it won all these awards and like best picture awards. And I'm like, what the hell is uh, like a kid's film doing winning all these awards? You know, they usually sometimes get good ratings, but uh, the film was a huge hit and I hadn't seen it for years. I'm guessing this was probably some kind of a blockbuster rental at the time. Okay. Do you remember when you first saw it, mom? I think it was in the theater. Really? Mm. No, maybe not. Maybe I rented it. I don't really remember now. And I didn't remember any of the movie either. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, it was kind of funny. What I did was I saw that the movie wasn't on any of the streaming services. So I requested it on DVD from the library, like I always do. And then Courtney made fun of me because she was like, I have that on DVD downstairs because she loves the movie too. (laughs) And so I didn't need to get it from the library I remembered it kind of, but definitely not all of the the beats. I kind of vaguely remember that they were singing animals. I thought maybe they were chipmunks. They're mice, but you know, honest mistake. I kind of vaguely remember that, but I really don't remember 
seeing it much. This, this was not like a beloved movie of my childhood, and I guess not of yours either, James. No, but now remembering, you know, when I watched this film last, this was a pandemic film. I watched this oh. early on in the pandemic when it was like, oh, you've never seen Babe? Oh, let's watch Babe. And uh, nothing else to do, you know, when everyone else is watching Tiger King and you're already done with, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever else we were watching then. Right, right. I think Babe is a better watch than Tiger King. I think Tiger <laughs> King just, I, I felt very dirty and icky after watching that. You don't feel that way after watching Babe, hopefully. No. Nah. I mean, the animals in Tiger King were very sweet, uh, you know, mostly. You know, the, the cats did nothing wrong, but uh, the, 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 the humans were definitely of higher quality, mostly, in, in Babe. Yes, exactly. All right, so why don't I remind our listeners uh, what Babe is about. It's about a kind-hearted pig named Babe, and he is adopted by a farmer, and then he soon develops the dreams of becoming a sheepdog. At first, Babe is dismissed by the farm's border collie, who believes that pigs can't be sheepdogs. But Babe's gentle nature and his determination eventually wins over the other farm animals. They ultimately help him on his journey to become the best sheepdog, or sheep pig, ever. And in doing so, Babe earns respect for both himself and his farmer owner. So this movie was a hit when it came out, even though I don't remember going to see it in the theater because, you know, we were, what, uh, 14, 15 when this came out. This wasn't really in our wheelhouse, but I remember this was a big deal when it came out. Yeah, it was a big hit when it came out on August 4th, 1995. I saw from a couple sources that it had a $30 million budget, which seems pretty high, but um, it opened at number three on its opening weekend. The number one that weekend was this notorious, well, it was a so-called flop. It actually eventually apparently made back its money, but it was a very, very talked about Kevin Costner flop from 1995. Called? Or uh, were you supposed to guess? Yeah, you're supposed to guess. I don't know. All right, Rochelle, do you know? No, I can't think of it. All right, tell him, Al. You know it. Is it Waterworld? It is Waterworld. Uh, Okay. Yeah, so uh, that film (laughs) was number one. Don't remember that. And Babe, Babe was the little uh, pig that could because it opened at $8 million. It ended up with $63 million domestically. That's almost an eight times multiplier. That's, uh, that basically means that, you know, people saw the majority of this film not on opening weekend. So, you know, a lot of word of mouth for this film. Um, It made $254 million worldwide. So, yeah, huge success and uh, you know, tons of awards. And um, James Cromwell, the, the star, apparently he only earned $50,000 for the film and he took it mostly because it was a free trip to Australia. And uh, he asked them for more money when the film made millions and millions and they said no. But he said he didn't really have hard feelings because this made his entire career. And he said um, after that film, he never had to audition ever again. So really? you know, I guess he got a lot out of it. I thought he was excellent. And... I can't think of anyone else who could have done a better role as Farmer Hoggett. Uh, He was just perfect. You know, you could almost imagine like Clint Eastwood playing it, but he's a little bit too angry because there's a softness to to Haggard because, you know, he doesn't execute Babe when he could. And instead he brings the duck for uh, Christmas dinner. But James Cromwell, sometimes called Jamie Cromwell. I don't know if you know that. Did not. That kind of makes him like... Your spiritual brother, kind of, you know, a a James that likes to be called Jamie. And um, he is in another movie that uh, you're going to be seeing at some point, Al. What's that? That movie is called Star Trek First Contact. (laughs) I am not looking forward to that. But okay. okay. You know who surprised me being involved in this film, Al? I had Who's no that? idea, but this film was produced by George Miller. Yes. George Miller of Mad Max fame and many other films that are not, you know, talking pig-esque. Yeah, I was very, very surprised by that because he has worked on many other films, but really his name will forever be associated with Mad Max Mom, have you ever seen the Mad Max movies? No, I have not. Okay, okay. Rochelle, have you? No, not my era. Gotcha. Okay. Actually, I think I've only seen the newest one that came out, which I enjoyed. But yeah, those are like futuristic, dystopian, Mel Gibson shooting people movies. So then to know that he was not just a producer on Babe, he is one of the screenwriters. So 
he was very, very involved. He did also write Happy Feet, and I think its sequel. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, so he does have some family-friendly movie cred, you know, from Babe and Babe Pig in the City and Happy Feet and Happy Feet 2. But yeah, it's not really the person you would associate with this kind of movie with adorable farm animals. <laughs> Um, but Rochelle, I'm I'm curious to get your perspective on the movie as someone who had never seen it before. Was it what you were expecting? Actually, I'm surprised I'd never seen this before. It seems like it should have been a classic children's film. Um, it was a big box office hit, and it could have been another film like E.T. or maybe even Wizard of Oz. I mean, it's probably a stretch. But at least as popular as some of the Disney films, and it had some themes of Disney films like um, Dumbo, where Dumbo is ripped from his mother's arms, and mm -hmm. where Dumbo makes his way in the world on his own. So I really did enjoy it, and I actually just saw it for the second time twice in two days. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I rented it. It was a 48-hour <laughs> rental. So I might as well get, I might as well get my, my money's worth. That's great. And, uh, you know, it's interesting you say that because uh, I mentioned that it was this huge hit worldwide. But in America, um, just looking at the box office for 1995, Babe was the fourth biggest family film, but it came in at number 27. Something about it, either it just wasn't marketed right, or um, I'm not sure why. Yeah, it wasn't the huge smash. I mean, it was it made its money back, certainly, and certainly worldwide. But you're right, it should have been uh, higher up there. You know, it, it's interesting as you're talking about how Babe is ripped away from his mother as a baby, and we're talking about this for our Mother's Day episode. <laughs> yeah, like you're saying, it, it does have that Disney hallmark, you know, where in so many Disney movies, the main character has a mom or both parents die horrifically and tragically right at the start of the movie. Uh, but this movie also has the adoptive mother with the dog who really becomes Babe's surrogate mom, Fly. And it's implied that she's very maternal. And then at one point, Babe says, can I call you mom? After she loses her puppies because she's a breeding dog and her puppies are for sale. So it's not necessarily the happiest mother's movie for Mother's Day. But there is like a nice mother-son relationship in there. Yes. Well, Michelle, when you were talking about it being like a classic, it reminded me of another classic that I love. Charlotte's Web. I thought of that too. Because of the friendship and the love, and they were trying to save the pig from being eaten. Right. So it reminded me right. a lot of that too. And both pigs were the runt of the litter, I think. Wasn't that true? Wilbur was. I'm not sure about Babe. I don't know. Is Babe the runt of the litter, or do they just kind of grab him sort of like randomly? I think he was left behind. Uh, they they actually say in the voiceover that there's absolutely no reason for it. It was totally random, and Babe happened to be the pig that they picked. Mm. Speaking of, you know, Babe being spared, right? Like, that is kind of his role on the farm. He's going to be eaten. That's what happens to pigs on farms. James, I know you don't eat pork because you're a good Jew and you're kosher. Rochelle, do you keep kosher as well? Yeah, we don't eat pork. Okay. When you watch a movie like this, it does sort of make you feel a little bit bad about eating animals. And James Cromwell became vegan after working on this oh, movie. Yeah? yeah. I think I read that he was a vegetarian before, but then he went full vegan after his experience working on the movie because people would ask him about it and he maybe had some issues about eating meat before. I thought that was really interesting that it turned one person into a vegan and I would assume that other kids saw this movie and then were like, oh, wait, that's what bacon is? That's what these pulled pork sliders are? Maybe I don't want to eat that. Whether you're kosher or not, you could also maybe think that about duck. You don't want to eat duck, the adorable Ferdinand. Well, I think it's one of these films that kids learn where, at, where food comes from. I mean, there's not many uh, times that you learn it literally comes from you know, chopping that dog's head off. I and mean, that's what it is. <laughs> right, right. And I mean, it's dark, but it does sort of fit the themes of the movie about, you know, what 
your purpose is. And yeah, for animals, that's often their purpose. Right. And there's a part at the end when uh, the cat, who's you know kind of played as the bad guy of the film, the cat tells Babe, uh, you know, humans eat pigs. And Babe had no idea. There's even this thing in the beginning where he thought that uh, the big fat pigs that are so big and fat, they get taken off somewhere. And it's so wonderful that no pig has ever come home from it. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it's a cute uh, yeah, pig heaven or something, <laughs> like, or it certainly is big heaven. You know, it's you a very it. cute way that Babe has no idea what his purpose I think, is. I think there were a lot of life lessons for the children in this movie, both good and bad. And some of the realistic things they learn is mortality and um, loss. Also, there's a little violence and fear in there. Those are the negative things. I mean, a lot more positive things. But these are life lessons that I think children learn to understand. Uh, this was done in a gentle way, but realistically. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, after we watched the movie, I asked my daughter what she thought the lesson of the movie was. And I wrote it down because I thought it was adorable. She said that it's not to judge others because they might be able to do things you don't expect. Which I thought was a, a very sweet way of looking at it. And I think that's very true. I think there's other themes in there, like you're saying, Rochelle, but I thought that was... That was a nice takeaway from a nine-year-old. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I Thank couldn't you. help but notice there's almost, uh, you know, the obvious uh, comparisons, but almost Animal Farm-like. Uh, you know, Animal Farm is very, like, you know... Uh, uh, a pig is a pig, and uh, and a dog is a dog, and you know they they very much have that theme here. And at the beginning, uh, Rex, the main sheepdog, he's very angered that a you know a pig is going to be a, a sheepdog. And uh, did you notice, by the way, who the voice of Rex is? It's the only other big name in this film. He certainly wasn't a big name in 1996 or 95. But did you see who it was, Al? I saw. I didn't recognize it while I was watching the movie. Did you know who it was, Mom? No. Did you know, Rochelle? No. Who is it? It's a Hugo Weaving. He's a, he became a big actor. He was uh, the bad guy in all the Matrix films. He was an elf in all the Lord of the Rings films. Uh, very famous actor. And I guess, you know, one of these Australian guys that, uh, you know, just popped up on this Australian film from 95. I didn't recognize his voice. I did recognize Babe's voice as being very, very familiar. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And I looked it up. The voice actor who does Babe also did Chucky Finster on Rugrats. Remember Rugrats? Nice. Yeah. yeah. yeah and it's very, very <laughs> similar to very similar. that voice. Just, you know, the kind of anxious little kid kind of voice. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, we watch Rugrats a lot. Yeah. I really like that show. I thought that was, a, that was a cute one. Yeah. yeah. Christine Cavanaugh was her name. Oh, it's a woman. Yeah, yeah. Oh. She died fairly young. She was like 51 years old when she died. That's sad. It is sad. But I loved her as Chucky Finster. <laughs> and the, the animals themselves, when they're talking, it's some live action, it's some animatronics. I thought it looked pretty good for, okay. for 95, right? Yeah, I thought so. I thought it was exactly as good as it needed to be. I also thought it was interesting that the animals could speak to each other, but the humans could not speak to the animals. Right. Like the animals called Babe, Babe, but Farmer Hoggett called her Pig. He didn't know her name, Babe. He couldn't understand animal language. Only the animals could converse with each other. And I was also going to say, um, it's supposed to be filmed in Australia, but everyone had American accents. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if they would do that today. Well, you know, it's funny. When the animals were talking, I thought their lips or beaks or whatever were moving along with their words just fine. Mm -hmm. But the farmer's wife, uh, Mrs. Hoggett, her sink was totally off. Her words never matched her mouth. And I wonder, I don't know if this is true, but I wonder if she was an Australian actress who had a thick Australian accent and so they they redubbed her at least for American audiences because I thought that was distracting the ducks and the pigs and the dogs their mouths were fine but Mrs. Hoggett everything she said her mouth was wildly off 
I didn't notice. Maybe she was dubbed in like ADR or something. Oh, definitely. She was definitely dubbed with ADR. And there's a lot of shots where she's talking from a distance. So you can't really see her mouth move. I think that was deliberate. <laughs> that's kind of funny to me that that's the one that's out of sync. You know, the, um, I do want to uh, ask you about the voiceover because this film does have a lot of voiceover. I personally, uh, I thought it fit the film, but I was wondering if uh, what you thought, Al, because you famously uh, have a, a problem with most, not all voiceovers. You liked, I believe, Shawshank Redemption voiceover was the one you said was okay. I, I've said there are a few that don't bother me. This one is, I think, one that's okay because the voiceover isn't just telling you what you're seeing, which is my pet peeve, the voiceover is explaining the world, and this this movie feels like a book, and it was adapted from a children's book, and so having a narrator sort of explaining this world to the children who are watching it, it's fine. The reason that they have the singing mice read the titles of the, I guess you'd call them chapters, is because little kids were seeing the movie in uh, test screenings, and they couldn't read it. So, you know, the parents were reading the words to their kids. So then they decided to have some characters singing the words, which is adorable. Uh, And I remember when I first showed my kids Star Wars, the opening crawl, it's not super fast. But if you're, you know, a young kid and you're just learning how to read, it is kind of fast. When Greedo or the aliens are speaking and there's the subtitles, I would just read it to them. So... It's a cute solve, you know, having the the mice sing it. But to your point about the voiceover, no, it didn't really bother me because it's for kids and you're just kind of hand-holding a little bit, but it was fine. Yeah, very cute. You know, one part on the voiceover I really liked was um, some of the jokes I was able to make. There was one part where... uh, Rex is talking to the sheep, the voiceover saying, because if there's one truth in the world, it's that sheep are incredibly stupid. (laughs) And then when the sheep are talking about uh, Rex, they're like, if there's one thing, uh, truth in the world, it's that all wolves are, uh, I don't know what he said. Stupid. It was stupid. It was stupid? Yeah. That was the joke, was that one group of animals think the other are stupid and you'll never convince them otherwise, and that group thinks that the other group is stupid and you'll never convince them otherwise. So it's kind of hand-holding the the point, but that's okay, because it's a kid's movie about all prejudices are stupid. You think that this group is stupid. They're not. There's no reason for you to think that. And they think you're stupid Mm -hmm. and you're not. That's stupid for them to think that. And everyone's fine. And if we could all just talk to each other and treat each other like equals, everything is so much easier. Everything's better. You don't need to bite the sheep because you're trying to get the sheep to go somewhere. If you just ask nicely, (laughs) the sheep will go wherever you want them to. It's just manners. Mm -hmm. That's a maternal thing, right? Moms teach manners. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a part of this film that I didn't remember, that uh, that fly, who's this, you know, she's this sweet, motherly sheep. She says, um, hey, this is a matter of fact. Um, sheep are stupid, and you need to take control. You need to bite them if you need to. Do whatever you need to. And she demonstrates early on in the beginning that the sheep absolutely listen to her when she's uh, dominating them. But, you know, maybe they can learn a little bit from... Uh, from Babe as well. It, it, it's a cute lesson. You, you know, of course, there's a little bit of cheating that goes on, a little bit. Speaking of lessons, I think another lesson that that brings up is don't make stereotypes. You know, all sheep are stupid. Yeah. All dogs are wolves. And you see this with Babe, who's supposed to be a pig. And he doesn't want to be a pig. He doesn't want the stereotype of of being a victimized piece of bacon. He wants to be a, a, a sheepdog. So he's not a stereotype either. So I think the stereotype theme holds both for groups of animals and for individuals. You can be whatever you want. Was it he who wanted to be the sheepdog or was it the farmer who wanted him to be the sheepdog? I think Babe kind of wanted to be a sheepdog. And then once uh, Rex was kind of... When he was out of commission. Yeah, then, you know, uh, Farmer Hoggett kind of needed a new sheepdog and Babe seemed to fit the bill. Gotcha. But yeah, I I think it's about 
prejudices and stereotypes and also sort of like what you're saying, James, that like fly is very nice, but she does have a point that if you bite the sheep, the sheep go where you want. And that's sort of tied with this other theme. That's just the way things are. And you don't just have to accept the way things are just because it has been true that it works to bite the sheep doesn't mean that that's the only way that things can work. You know, the way things are doesn't mean that's the way things should be. Right. Or that the way things always have to be. And so you can kind of challenge that status quo and the world can still function. And be better. Exactly. Exactly. Differently isn't worse. I like how the farmer figures it out, too, because there's a scene where there's some uh, rogue uh, dogs that come and break into the uh, meadow and they attack the sheep and they kill the, the mother sheep. And Babe saves the day, headbutting the dogs and, uh, you know, driving them out of the meadow and they run away. And Babe goes over to Mon and, you know, the, the Babe's covered in some blood. So when the farmer comes over and sees babe he's ready to basically kill babe i mean pigs do have teeth you know boars will kill you and right before he's about to kill the the pig uh the the dog she finds out from the sheep that uh what really happened she saves the day but right when she saves the day you also hear from the farmer's wife oh did you hear the police just called there's all these rogue dogs and then he goes huh and he quickly figures out well if the dogs weren't there when i got there and babe's covered in uh blood this is a crazy thing but maybe the uh pig did it and then he slowly sees the sheep listening to the pig he has the crazy idea and you know he doesn't have much to go on but i love his blind faith he knows that babe can do it there's not much there but he really does love this pig see i kind of hated that scene i thought that like he was way too quick to grab that shotgun Right? Like, he knows that Babe is gentle and is not violent. Like, he should know that Babe wouldn't attack the sheep. And just the fact that there's some blood on Babe seems pretty thin for him to, you know, decide to execute him. Because at that point, it seems like the farmer likes the pig and wouldn't necessarily jump to killing. He did a 180. Yeah, it was a very, very quick turnaround. And then, yeah, then the wife is saying, while her mouth is saying different words, but she's saying it was these other dogs. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I won't. Whoops. Yeah, right, right, right. I almost killed my beloved pig. And I mean, I guess maybe there's a message in there of just how the humans look at the animals as, you know, just animals and expendable. And if you kill one by mistake, eh, you still have a nice dinner. Or don't be so quick to judge. That's another theme there too. Yeah, but I think that's exactly what he did at first. You know, none of the four of us are farmers. We don't deal with animals every day. And I think when you're a farmer, if an animal hurts another animal, you you just got to put that thing down. And I think he at first was like, look, I have no other explanation for it. Uh, You know, I don't see any other dogs here. And, uh, you know, I agree. He was maybe a little quick to it. But I think by his logic, he goes, oh, that's it. No chances. There's no second chances, even though the dog did bite him at one point and he gives a second chance. But there is obviously in this world a hierarchy of animals. So, you know, the dog does get another chance. The cat, when it's annoying, it gets thrown out of the house. But, uh, you know, the pig and, uh, you know, Ferdinand the duck thinks ducks are the kind of the lowest on the pole there. So when you bring up Ferdinand the Duck, I also didn't love the kind of bait and switch that they do where it's Christmas and there's going to be one animal for dinner because they say Christmas is carnage, which I thought was kind of funny. And it makes sense from the farm animal's point of view. It's going to be the pig or the duck. And then it turns out it's the duck because, of course, it's not going to be babe. Babe is the main character of the movie you know you're not really expecting it to be babe but then it's the duck and then it's not ferdinand the duck it's this other duck that was expendable duck. right it, right it was like uh james you love star trek don't they call it like a red shirt like this other character who's just there only to die and it's like oh that's kind of like a narrative cheat if you're gonna kill a character kill a character don't just be like oh yeah there was this other duck that we never saw never talked about and that's the one that died 
I think that was for the kids. I mean, they just killed Babe's mom. I mean, <laughs> give, give the kids watching this film a break. Yeah, it was a bait and switch. <laughs> yeah, They could just order in pizza, maybe. I don't know. Is there pizza in Australia? Probably. Is there pizza in Australia? No. Uh, <laughs> they don't have dough or cheese. Let's go and find out. They have it in Australia, but it's upside down. Right. <laughs> But um, bum. Uh, uh, a dad joke for the moms. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The moms liked it. Speaking of things for, for moms, the scene at Christmas when the son and daughter-in-law or daughter and son-in-law, I wasn't really sure which, yeah. but they give the parents, Farmer Hoggett and his wife, a fax machine and they have no idea how to use it. Sorry, Mom, if this is disrespectful on Mother's Day, but that did kind of make me think of any time I have ever given you a present that has technical technology based. That's right. Where, where you're like, oh, this is nice. I don't need it. How do I do it? What is this? What's the point of it? You, you don't want a fax machine? Right, right, right. Well, why don't you take the fax machine? No, I have it. And now you need to have one, too. And that did kind of make me think of you. Yeah. I didn't, but I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say that too, no? No, it, it tore right over my head. <laughs> oh, okay. I think that's a common theme that parents are always low tech compared to their kids. I had an issue with my computer. Eli walked into the house yesterday. Five minutes he had to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> there you go. I guess that's what grandkids are for. Exactly. Just as an aside, my other son, Andy made some very interesting comments when his daughter graduated from eighth grade. He said to her, in order to succeed in life, there are two principles you have to remember. Number one, be nice. Number two, work hard. I never forgot that. And I remember when I saw this film, Babe, for the second time, I thought that Babe was incredibly sweet and polite and respectful, not insulting. Even when people made fun of Babe, he was very kind. And he was very, very hardworking. You know, it took a lot of work to succeed as a pig sheep or sheep pig, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> right. It reminded me of what my son Andy said to his daughter, to succeed in life, work hard and be nice. So that was a theme I, I thought uh, was a good life lesson for kids who watch this movie. Definitely. James, you're a big Conan O'Brien fan. Did he say something similar like on his last show? I vaguely remember he said something like that where, you know, he kind of got screwed out of The Tonight Show and he could have been mad and he could have been angry and he could have been bitter. And he ended his show by saying something like, work hard, be nice to people, good things will come to you. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. He basically, he could have said whatever he wanted to on the last uh, closing monologue of the last show. I mean, what were they going to do? Fire him again? He had basically the most open mic ever, and he decided to actually thank NBC for, you know, the like 18 years he had worked for them. And then later, yeah, in, in interviews, he talked about how, yeah, he decided just just be nice. It's, it's just not uh, worth it there. And work hard, you know, that stuff too. And there's a part where uh, in, in this film, Film where Babe tries to do more like what the sheepdogs do, and she she yells at the at the sheep. It's very cute when uh, Babe is trying to make fun of them, uh, saying like, "Oh, you nincompoops" or something like that. I don't know what it was, but it was something incredibly like G-rated. And then she actually does something. Uh, she she bites them, and the sheep are like, "What the hell are you doing? You, we were just talking about how what a like sweet little kid you are." And then Babe's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kids act out. I mean, that that's a thing that happens. A very sweet, nice kid can have a temper tantrum. As a father, I know that. <laughs> As a mother, you know that. Rochelle, you know that. That, yes. that happens. Also, I think what he was trying wasn't working. So he had been told to go about it this way. So he figured he'd give it a shot. Right. The ending of the movie where Babe wins this contest of sheepdogs and technically it's not against the rules and they let Babe do it. What'd you think of that scene? I thought it was great. 
he was technically right. And the dog had been trained and he, he did the best job. So it was only right that he should win. Rochelle, what do you think of the, of that ending? So the end of the uh, movie just showed us that if you root for the underdog, that underdog is often the hero and will win. And that's a common theme you've seen in, in many movies. So I really like that. And it also shows that you, you should believe in yourself. Babe believed in himself. If you believe in yourself, if you have self-confidence, you can actually succeed. That should have been the tagline for the movie. You'll root for the underdog who's really an under pig or, or, <laughs> right. or something like that. There's something there. That yeah. wasn't exactly it, but there's something in there. You know, th- this film reminded me, uh, or this part reminded me of a very obscure film that's beloved by the uh, by the Brie family, because there were a couple random VHS cassettes that we had, uh, it was this obscure Disney film from the 1970s called Gus, and it's this film about a mule that is recruited to play football, because basically it can kick field goals, and it's a terrible team, and it, you know, it's, it's your typical sports formula, and when they first bring the mule out, of course there's controversy and the other team objects, but then they look in the playbook and they're like, it technically says like the team has to have this many players on each side, it doesn't say men it doesn't say women so technically it could be uh, uh, an animal and I just love how big a deal sheep herding is in this community and it's like on television and like it's a huge thing and I completely (laughs) believe this because I've seen small town little uh, competitions and they have these weird things so weird to us but you know not weird to them there's just this moment when babe is finally herding the sheep and everything goes silent everyone's in awe the broadcasters are like ah buh and they can't say anything And the moment this uh, rickety fence is shut, the audience goes absolutely insane. They've never seen anything like it. And it's such a heartwarming ending. I absolutely love it. It is cute. When you say that you can believe that it's a big deal, do they ever say that this movie is in Australia? Do they ever say the words Australia or like Outback or anything like that? And it doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be that, you know, sheep herding is a big deal in Australia. America or any other country in the world, but you just assume rural place somewhere. I mean, I've been to the Houston rodeo. I mean, the rodeos, I mean, these things are huge. Um, My mother and I, we used to go to this, uh, this country fair that would have these, uh, these oxen pole and they would put like things (laughs) behind the oxen and, and two oxen would have like a yoke between them and they'd pull 1500 pounds and now 2000 pounds. And like people went nuts for this. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's different strokes for different folks. Where was that? That was in Connecticut, actually, at Riverton the uh, Riverton Fair. Fair. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Mom, how come you never took me to see oxen pull <laughs> stuff? Never heard of it. <laughs> it also had a blueberry eating contest. A bl- sorry, blueberry pie eating contest. It was one of those kind of country fair things. And like the winners would win like a rocking chair from the local like furniture <laughs> company. That's really what the prizes were. I mean, it, it, people went crazy for this stuff. A real throwback. <laughs> That's amazing. I want to win a rocking chair. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely what the what the prizes are. I think are. that fair still exists. Oh, it still exists. It absolutely does. And they, I wonder if they still do the oxen poll. <laughs> well, Rochelle, I'll ask you first. I think I asked you, Mom, first last time, and I'm not totally sure about that. But Rochelle, whatever. I'm asking you first. Do you think that Babe stands a test of time? I do, except for a few throwbacks like the fax machine. <laughs> Right, But other than that, absolutely. I think the life lessons still stand today. They're classic. All right. Mom, what do you think? I would have to agree. I mean, it seemed like a little old fashioned, but it was then as much as it is now. The only modern thing in it was the fax machine. What do you mean by old fashioned? Well, I guess like how he put together the fence and their house. Maybe it was just because it was in the outback or wherever. Right. It didn't look very modern. Gotcha. You know, the story, the basic story, absolutely would stand the test of time. Okay. James, what do you think? Um, I think the story is beautifully shot. Um, I I didn't mention that. Um, I think the cinematography is great. Uh, James Cromwell, I agree with you, Mom. He's fantastic in this film. 
I would imagine that James Cromwell is as surprised about this film as uh, as everyone else was. You know, I think he probably went, oh, yeah, the, the story about a pig and, you know, there's going to be a little puppets or something. And, well, whatever. I get a free trip to Australia, 50 grand. You know, he's not exactly a famous actor at this time. So it's a pretty good way to support your family. But uh, it turns out to be this beautiful little story. You know, the, the fax machine, in the context of the story, I actually think it works very well in that, yeah, it's a stupid gift to give to his parents who live on a farm. But if you notice, that's how he enters the uh, pig in the contest. And he doesn't yes. have to talk to anyone. You know, he doesn't have to discuss, oh, and what is your dog's name? And because he's technically not lying on the uh, on the application. So the, the fax machine does come in handy. You really can't date this film except for the fax machine, which is a strictly mm. 1992 to... 2000 uh, piece of technology with the asterisk that uh, doctor's offices still use fax machines that were like the only ones that used beepers forever and fax machines. I don't know why we can't adapt, but um, I think the um, special effects uh, work as well as they should. Um, I don't believe it's CGI because I, I think if it was CGI, we would definitely see it since it was 1995. And thank yeah. goodness they did not try to do any early 1995 CGI with a Thirty million dollar budget. So, uh, I think overall the, the the movie stands the test of time. I will say, Al, the the one thing that you brought up, the mice. That's the only one thing that is a little bit too kitty for me. I probably would have liked the very first draft of this or the very first cut of it better. I'm fine with it, but I could definitely use without the uh, the mice. It does take a, away a little bit of the like, oh, this is a movie that like adults and kids can sit next to each other and love. It's a little bit kitschy, but um, overall, it's just a lovely little film and, you know, it didn't deserve to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, but this is one of those things that should just, you know, be nominated for Best Picture and it was in a one-off all these other awards and film critic awards and it's just you know the little film that could which is the theme of the film itself so it's like rocky winning best picture it, itself being its own theme so i really like this film and it does stand the test of time that's three people that like this film said stood the test of time are we four for four al give it to us straight does it stand the test of time <laughs> I can skip to the end and say, I think, yes, it does stand the test of time, just so I'm not keeping people on the edge of their seat. I will say, though, I don't think this movie is as amazing as some people think it is. Just like reading stuff online and talking to Courtney and, and some other people, some people really put this movie on a pedestal as like an all time classic kids movie. I think there are better kids movies i think there are better kids movies about talking animals i think there are better kids movies about talking animals that teach you the lesson that just because you're one type of animal doesn't mean you can only do one thing name one zootopia did you see zootopia no was that the one with the sloths at the dmv <laughs> yes okay. exactly that's all i remember <laughs> exactly exactly and the main character in that movie is a bunny rabbit who wants to be a police officer and everyone laughs at her because how can she be a police officer she's an adorable little bunny she can't be a cop and then of course she solves the mystery and proves that anyone can do anything and i think zootopia is a very very good movie Disney made an announcement about, like, we're making Toy Story 5 and we're making uh, Frozen 3 and Zootopia 2. And everyone was focused on, like, the Toy Story 5 and the Frozen 3 thing. But I was like, yeah, they should definitely make more Zootopia movies. That could be, like, a huge franchise. But whatever. I think there are elements of Babe that feel dated more in terms of, like, the storytelling. That's how I said it was old-fashioned. Oh, okay. The general feel of it. Yeah, I mean, like, two things specifically I'm talking about. One is Ferdinand, who is the duck that isn't killed, is not the Christmas duck, and then Ferdinand runs away from the farm and will never be seen again, but then kind of comes back, but there's no real payoff to Ferdinand coming back. There's no, like, lessons Ferdinand learned along the way. And also, when those thieves come and steal some of the sheep, you know, that's important for the plot in terms of Babe discovering what Babe can do and the farmer discovering what Babe can do. 
But I was just kind of expecting those robbers to come back or maybe Babe catches the robbers later and rescues the sheep that were stolen or something like that. They I just went and that was it. Yeah. Hobbit yeah. It didn't go after them. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that, it's just kind of left as sort of a, a loose end. You would think that there should be some more resolution to some of those threads. I, I think that's sort of like more of a modern movie you know like if you're gonna have something like that happen the story is gonna close like the, even if it's a subplot you will close that thread those thieves will be caught those sheep will be rescued or not but you'll find out what happened to that so that to me kind of felt old-fashioned so when, when you said old-fashioned i was curious um how you meant it so little things like that i think are a little off in terms of the movie standing the test of time but overall all of the themes that it is teaching children and adults about morality mortality purpose being kind uh having good friends family all of those things are great lessons and the movie doesn't really beat you over the head with it i think it it just kind of works honestly like as a fable you know, mm -hmm. with, the, with the talking animals. I, I feel like it works when you sort of look at it as like a children's book, a children's fable. So for all of those reasons, I'll say that, yes, it does stay on the test of time. So good pick, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Yay. We didn't go 444 last year with the big chill. Uh, we didn't? We didn't? Um, Let me check. I will check our our spreadsheet. We did go 444 with the big chill. We all said yes. Oh, we did. Oh, okay. I think you liked it less than the rest of us loved it. I did like it less than everyone else did. But I, I also said think it was a great title for Mother's Day, Babe. It's a maternal uh, concept. So perfect for Mother's Day. Very different from The Big Chill, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very different. Very different. Not that The Big Chill is bad, but yeah, I think this is more of a Mother's Day movie. Yes. So then I guess the only question left is what are we going to do for Mother's Day 2024? <laughs> mm. We'll have to think about that one. Absolutely. We have 364 days to think. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Guys, this was so much fun. It was. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us both again. Yes. Of course, of course. This was a lot of fun. Happy Mother's Day to you, Mom. Thank to you, you Rochelle. To, you, Rochelle. to all the moms listening out there or maternal figures, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. And Alan, we did a sweet little kid story, babe, for Mother's Day. What would be the opposite that we could do next week? <laughs> well, next week we have a very special guest coming on the show. My buddy Clinton Festa is joining us to talk about Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> Mom, you know Clint. He's a friend of mine from college, and he was anxious to come on the show, and that was the movie he picked. I've never seen it, but I'm imagining it's going to be very, very, very different from Babe. We were going to do Conan the Barbarian for Mother's Day and Babe with Clint, <laughs> but, uh, <yeah. laughs> Oh, man, that would have been perfect. Uh, but Clint called dibs. Oh, that's okay. That's all right. But until next week, we want to hear from everyone. Write to us at Test of Time Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you are maybe a person who's not really good at technology and you don't like social media, maybe you could send us an email, the Test of Time Podcast at gmail.com. Mom, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> you notice that because you're not on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. But you could still contact us via email. Or, you know, you could call me. Yeah. So that, you know, that, that's probably what you would do. But we will see you next time, everybody. And happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.